Thank you, Ms. Kari. We're very excited for today's service with Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. Thank you. And happy Mother's Day, Mama and Oma, and all those mothers out there. We are very blessed to have amazing women in our church and in our lives who have influenced us majorly. So, but this morning, I want to start off with reading from Psalms 103, and it says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, all my soul, and forget not one of all of his benefits, who forgives all of our iniquities, who heals all our diseases, who redeems our life from destruction, and who crowns us with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies our years with good things, so that our youth is renewed like the eagles. Amen. Bless the Lord, all my soul. All my soul. Yeah. Forget none of these benefits. God has benefits. God has benefits, and they're good benefits. It's good. Praise God. So what have we got on today, Chloe? Well, we got a dial-in praise and worship again from Andreas, which will be good. And, of course, outreach prayer in Bullcock Street. And then we also have a Mother's Day video from the kids in our church. And I have to say, we've got the cutest kids I've ever seen. And so I'm excited for that. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, God. They're gorgeous. And we've got a message on, I found a righteous God. Yeah. Praise God. So... Dial in worship from our uh, Swedish Danish connection. Hi, all. Uh, so, my song is Come Awake in Love by 100G Thompson from Bethel. Um, and we uh, heard his songs in the worship room in uh, the month of May last year. And one of the lines that I love about this song is Burn within my soul until I see your eyes. Amen. Let's praise God.
thank you, Lord, for the love that you have towards us as your people, that we are in covenant with you. And Lord, we thank you. It says in your word, it says that no temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful. Amen. He will not thank allow you, you to be tempted beyond what you are able. You, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also, so that you will be able to endure it. And Father, we thank you that we are always on the way out of any trouble, any trial, any mm -hmm. test. Lord, we just thank you that there is a way of escape that you have planned for us as your people. And Lord, I pray for every single person who is part of our church, Lord. We thank you that you have a safe place, a plan of escape for each one of us, Lord, that you uphold us, that you sustain us, that you provide for us. Thank you that we lack for nothing because you are our God. You are our source. And we look to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. It's a great scripture. Yeah. There is no test that's come upon your temptation. Yeah. That uh, you'll be able to, it says you'll be able to endure because and he'll provide a way out for you. Yeah. So if you're being tested, there's a way out. I think it's also too, like always whenever I read that, it's like you're always... Just because you're going through the valley of death doesn't mean you just stop and camp there. You go through it, all the way through it. So everything that we're going through right now, we're all feeling it, but we don't just yeah. stay in camp here. We go through it. So it doesn't say, it. yay, though I dwell in the valley of death. The gay no. though I live there. Yay, no. though I set up tent in the valley of death. Yeah, no. They are walk through and actually, it. Doesn't the King James say the valley of the shadow the of shadow death? The shadow of death, yeah. yeah. One preacher said the shadow of the dog never bit anyone. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> True. <sighs> Praise God. So you, we uh, had uh, an outreach, it, uh, you've done an outreach prayer for us, an outreach video. Yeah. And uh, it's really good. You know, I think you're talking about developing trust. Yeah. Is that right? Developing trust and yeah. the importance of those everyday conversations we have with Amen. people on the street that we meet every day. So. Yeah, because it's good to remember that we, uh, that God is a God of grace and, and mercy and, but, and he doesn't force himself on people. Mm. But everyone in their own way is looking for God. So they will give us permission through different ways yeah. to, sh to share with them. Yeah. So we don't watch the video. So the average person will have five significant encounters with another Christian in order for them to receive Jesus as their Lord. Which I find interesting because Jesus and the woman at the well, that woman had a very significant encounter with Jesus. When Jesus asked her, give me a drink, in their culture and in that day and age, that was a very significant thing that Jesus did because what that was was showing acceptance and fellowship with that woman. And for today, this day and age, obviously we don't have a water and well to give to people, but what does that look like in our day and age? Last week, one of my clients, Imogen, shared her testimony about how she received Jesus as her Lord. The way that our relationship developed was I would see her every single week to obviously do some PT sessions together, but every single week I would ask her how she likes to spend her time. Through those conversations, trust was developed. She would ask me about what I did over the weekend, and of course I would tell her that I went to church. The more that I talked about church, the more curious she would get, so she would continuously ask me more questions about church, about Jesus, all those kinds of things. And through those conversations was how she got to hear the gospel. So it's that simple where we are developing that trust with people when they ask us about our weekend or they ask us about our lives. That is them giving you permission to share the gospel with them. So evangelism isn't shoving the gospel down people's throats. It's those simple conversations that we can have on a daily basis. When you come in contact with someone at the grocery store and they ask you what you do on the weekend, don't underestimate the significance of saying that you went to church because those small seeds, those encounters can produce a harvest. So let's pray over the people who we will come in contact with this week. So Heavenly Father, we thank you for opportunities to speak into people's lives. We thank you for eyes to see these people the way that you see them. We ask you for the right words to say and the wisdom of how to say it. And we pray over their hearts that they would have eyes that see, ears that hear, and hearts that understand. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
So I gave my life to the Lord, uh, well, I, I did quite young, and you were sharing with me the other day how you did when you were quite young, and I, I'd, I'd actually forgotten about it. Mm. And, um, and then as a 12-year-old, I was invited to go to a Christian camp by a guy called Sven, who lived up the road. And uh, just him inviting me and then going and just seeing the lives of Christians and, and the, the other lead, the leaders that were there, the teenagers. Um, and then on the Thursday, Thursday evening, 8.40, on the 17th of January, um, I gave my life to the Lord. But the, the thing to, the, that struck me was the process leading up to that, that so the, the, the guy who gave the message on Thursday evening, the 17th of January, he had no idea that God had been taking me on this journey yeah. with other people. So there was uh, the, youth, the youth work at the Salvation Army at, Her at, at Hurstful, uh, Mr. Wemus, and then there was the other friends that I met. And then to that point where my heart was open to receive from him. Yeah. So we're never to, not to, not to uh, ignore that God is actually working in all these people's lives to draw yeah. them to him. And our eyes are to be open. He says, look up, the eyes are white under harvest. So that lady was on a spiritual journey. Imogen, yeah. Uh, well, Imogen, but the oh, lady sorry. at the well. Yeah, yeah. The, the, and, 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 and just that, that trigger is so meaningful. Yeah. And we can miss it if our eyes aren't open to it. Yeah. That's very good. Thank you for sharing that with us. You're getting quite a cinematographer. You've got quite a gift there with the video camera and all that. <laughs> the behind the scenes, it's like Tiff is like making, helping me walk through it. To Chloe, talk slow. Stop saying the word and 17 times. Yeah. <laughs> so it takes, it's a two minute video, but it takes me like an hour and a half to say it. <laughs> and you're getting these compliments from these international ministries again. Okay? Oh, it's so good. Okay. <laughs> it's good. It's like, yes. Anyway. Praise God. Offering. Offering. So we're going to go into the offering for our um, for today. And last week we talked about um, I found a God who is holy or I found a holy God. And these words, which is coming up in my heart, and it's actually found in Leviticus chapter 27 and verse 30. And it says, thus all the tithe of the land of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. And that word holy, if you look it up, it means to it consecrated, set apart, and it is sanctified before God. And to think about that, that means our tithe is holy to God. And how significant that thought is mm -hmm. that our tithe is holy. And it remind me of what um, Paul said in Philippians chapter 4. Because Paul was writing to the Philippian church who um, gave him money, sent him money. And if you read, he says, um, you yourselves know, you yourself also know Philippians, that at the first preaching of the gospel after I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, but you alone. For even in Thessalonica, you sent a gift more than once for my needs. Not that I seek the gift itself, but I seek for the profit which increases to your account. But I have received everything in full and have abundance. I'm aptly supplied, having received what you have sent, a fragrance, an aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. And this is holy. This time in our service is holy to God. It's not something to just discount as a typical Sunday routine, but it is holy to God. It is set apart. It is sanctified. It is consecrated. And I was thinking about this. That means money, when used the way God has ordained money to be used, money can be holy. Mm. And it's something that people consider money to be evil or it causes a lot of wars and um, separation in families even because it's not used correctly. However, to God, when you are tithing, when we give, that is holy to God. And I just love that Paul says mm. that. Like it is a sanctified aroma, a fragrance that is well pleasing to him. Wow. So because money really just represents part of our life. Yeah. It represents part of our working life. Yeah. So the first ten percent of time is the first ten percent of your working life. Yeah. Consecrating that to the Lord. Yeah. Praise God. It's good. Mm. And when you consecrate that first part to God, that is a good start with your money. It's the first good first thing to do with it mm. for sure. So let's pray over our offering this week. So, Father, we come before your throne, 
Lord, we thank you that as we give of our tithes and our offerings, Lord, that this is a holy time, a time that you have ordained in our services, Lord. And we just thank you as we give that you consider it holy, that it is sanctified and it is well-pleasing to you. And Lord, as we give, we expect to see in our own lives, Father, your honor in our lives, Lord. We lack for nothing. We thank you that our bills are paid, our jobs are blessed, and our businesses are blessed. As we move forward through these seasons, Lord, that the world may be in darkness right now, but Lord, we are in covenant with you, and we thank you that we are blessed to be a blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So how can people give to us, Chloe? So we have our BSB and account number, which can be found on the website, if it's not uh, on there yet. Um, we also have a PayPal it is account. on there. Yeah, and I think it's on, um, we've got the details up there. Yeah. Look at that, fantastic, praise God. Technology. And it is on the, I think it's on our Facebook page in one of the, the notes, so. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, if you consider this your church, then your tithes and offerings belong here, but if you're, if you're visiting for another church, then, then they need you to, your tithes to run, praise God. Yeah, good. So it's Mother's Day. Yes. It is Mother's Day. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and we're having, uh, we're having a lunch after this. Okay. Yeah, Mother's Day lunch. Yes, that's right. And these guys are invited. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we really do appreciate our mothers. They're such a, a blessing. I tear up when I think of how wonderful my mother was to me and even as an example of faith because she, she kept her faith right till the end of her life, praise God. And it, I, I was looking, some dear friends of mine, um, the Quilties, and they were kids, friends when we were growing up, and Gwen Quilty, who was uh, one of my mother's dear friends, passed away this week, a year ago. And they, she and, and her husband, Ron, Ron still alive, were always, I don't think if they knew it, but they were a testimony to me of their faith because they had such a joyful living faith and all their kids had grown up in the Lord. But their daughter, uh, they put a remembrance of her on Facebook. And the daughter, I've got to be careful not to tear up, but the daughter um, had recorded her last words and she was singing, and she sang at my mother's funeral, and she was singing It Is Well With My Soul. Mm -hmm. She was singing that uh, in the last moments of her life. And uh, Paul, Paul spoke to Timothy of, of the significance of his grandmother and his mother's yeah. faith. Yeah. In, in their life. And the role of women in the church has been essential and huge. You know, uh, the, the women were called apostles, they were given pastoral roles, they supported Jesus in ministry. The first, the first person to preach the resurrected Jesus Christ mm. was a woman, mm. praise God. So yeah. those of you who think women can't preach, put that in your pipe and smoke it because <laughs> she was ordained by God to preach the first one to preach the resurrected Christ. Yeah. So mothers play an incredible yeah. role. And we think two of the single mothers, single mothers in our church, mm -hmm. oh, what, that's the fantastic job that they do. So yeah. we love you. We appreciate you. Yeah. I know sometimes in the middle of the night, uh, it's hard to feel valued, but your value is in your family. Uh, you know, the, you're imparting something to the next generation, yeah. and, which is totally meaningful. So we're, it's time for the message, and we've been busy this week uh, filming the message. But it's, um, we're doing I Found a Righteous God. And typically, when we think of the word righteous, like the typical expression or meaning of righteous, we, we ask a Christian, and they say, a right, righteousness means a right relationship with God, which is not wrong, but it's not actually the full, the full, picture. Picture, the full picture because, and which we'll explain in this video, how it actually means to be correct, to be, to be totally true, to be morally perfect, mm -hmm. to um, always make right decisions and right actions. So that's what righteousness means. And we present in the, in the video, the the um, the problem that that creates for us not being righteous uh, on ourselves, and uh, and then how God resolved that so that we can get to the situation where in Christ we are righteous, yeah. and our righteousness is our right relationship with Him. Well, we've got our Bible ready, which is from Romans three. So you got your Bibles with you. Turn to Romans three. 
uh, and we're going to go verse 9 to 12 and 21 to 26. So this actually... Uh, this is from the Passion? The Passion, yes. Translation. So it says, so, we, so are we to conclude then that we Jews are superior to all others? Certainly not, for we have already proven that both Jews and Gentiles are all under the bondage of sin. And the scriptures agree, for it is written, there is no one who always does what is right. No, not even one. There is no one with true spiritual insight. And there is no one who seeks after God alone. All have deliberately wandered from God's ways. All have become depraved and unfit. Kindness has disappeared from them all. Not even one is good. And then in uh, Romans 3:21. But now, independently of the law, the righteousness of God is tangible and brought to light through Jesus, the anointed one. This is the righteousness that the scriptures prophesied would come. It is God's righteousness made visible through the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. And now all who believe in him receive that gift. For there really is there no difference between us. For if we all have sinned and, all, and are in need of the glory of God, Yet through his powerful declaration of acquittal, God freely gives us, gives away his righteousness. His gift of love and favor now cascades over us, all because Jesus, the anointed one, has liberated us from the guilt, punishment, and power of sin. Jesus's God-given destiny was to be the sacrifice to take away sins. And now he is our mercy seat because of his death on the cross. We come to him for mercy. For God has made a provision for us to be forgiven by faith in the sacred blood of Jesus. This is a perfect demonstration of God's justice because until now he had been so patient holding back his justice out of his tolerance for us. For he covered over the sins of those who lived prior to Jesus' sacrifice. And when the season of tolerance came to an end, there was only one possible way for God to give away his righteousness and still be true to both his justice and his mercy to offer up his own son. So now, because we stand on the faithfulness of Jesus, God declares us righteous in his eyes. Amen. Amen. That's beautiful. Can roll it. So we've been doing a series uh, at church on I found God about the nature and the person of God. And the first week we looked at a God who is knowable, a God that we can know. And the second week we talked about a God who wants to know us. And last week we looked at the first of his moral attributes, the moral attributes of God, and we talked about a God who is holy. I found a holy God. And this week we want to talk about a righteous God, a God who is right, a God who is correct. It's funny, uh, one of the very basic things that humans look for and, and kids look for all the time is fairness or rightness. And all the time you'll hear kids say, you know, that isn't fair, that isn't right, I haven't had my turn. There's a little boy waiting at the counter of a corner shop He's been waiting down there, waiting half the day They never ever see him from the top he gets pushed around, knocked to the ground. He gets to his feet and he says, What about me? It isn't fair. I've had enough. Now I want my share. Can't you see? I want to live. But you just take more than you give. There's a pretty girl serving. Who's to decide what is right? Who's to decide who is righteous? 
One of the, uh, easy, one of the best ways of, of thinking about it is to look at how the Hebrews came to this understanding of righteousness. And their original word had a lot to do with scales or weights or measurements. In fact, that it was based around the image of a weight that is used in the marketplace to measure something else as being the correct weight. Apparently, it was an issue in those times that people would fabricate a weight as being uh, lighter than what it says it is so that they would sell, undersell the produce. So this idea of rightness or correctness was based around being a correct scale by which you can measure other things. Statue of Justice at the Old Bailey. Compare those rather forbidding scales with the prehistoric limestone balance of BC 5000, reproduced with the others by courtesy of the Science Museum, South Kensington. This was the balance used in the spacious days of King Tut, about 1370 BC. The weights represented animals. A balance of Egyptian mythology about 1350 BC. Jeweler's scales of BC 600. The weights were bowl shaped and made of bronze. That's the feather of truth, which was supposed to ensure that the weight was correct. Roman scales found at Pompeii in AD 79, with the square weights of the period. But nothing less than a 20 grain weight produced any movement, so it wasn't very accurate. In the original box belonging to a Roman money changer nearly 1,600 years ago are these bronze scales that responded to a half grain weight. So if we have this understanding that righteousness means correctness, it means moral perfection, it means always being just and making the right decision, well, who decides what's right or what's wrong? The scriptures say that God alone is righteous. I'm at Point Cartwright at the lighthouse because there's a funny story I want to tell you about a lighthouse Captain, and a boat. Up to 1200. Sir, contact established. Answer bigger, please. This is A853. Please change your course by 15 degrees southwards in order to prevent a collision with us. This is the USS Lincoln, member of the United States Navy. Change your course by 15 degrees northwards in order to avert a collision with us. Over. This is not possible. You have to avoid. This is Captain Richard James Howard speaking, commander of the USS Lincoln aircraft carrier, part of the Navy of the United States of America. We are the second largest warship of the American fleet. We are escorted by two cruisers, six destroyers, and four submarines. I command you to change your course by 50 degrees northwards. If you do not comply, we will be forced to take necessary action. Over. This is Manuel Salas Alcantara. We are troopers. With us, we have our dog, we have two men. We have our food and a friend who is making a siesta right now. We do not move anywhere. We are a lighthouse on the coast of Spain. The righteousness of God is unchangeable. He is right whether we think he's right, whether we think he's wrong, he's right whether the world thinks he's right or the world thinks he's wrong. It is immutable. So that makes a big problem. If you don't believe in God, where do you base your morality? On what do you anchor? How can you say what's right or wrong? And this is the dilemma for atheists because really, if you're an atheist, your morality is only relative to everyone else. It's really just this is my opinion and that's your opinion. How can anything be absolutely right or wrong? I once had a dream that I made a glorious comeback to rugby union. The Brumbies were touring and they'd run out of reserves and so I got the big call up. She made me nervous. She took me in and gave me breakfast. And she said, Do you come from a land down under? 
I mean, it was a beautiful dream. I was like six foot six and just trim, taut, 150 kilograms of straight muscle. And uh, this delusional dream reminds me a bit of the atheist or even the self-righteous believer who thinks that they can make their own scale of righteousness somehow match God. But unlike our self-righteousness or our delusions of righteousness, when they're weighed up against God, there's no deceiving. Only God is righteous. So righteousness is a dilemma for the atheists. It's a dilemma for us because there's none righteous, no not one, and righteousness demands justice. But it also was a big dilemma for God because God wanted and wants a relationship with us. So how can it be that a just God can have a relationship with sinners, with people who deserve and demand judgment. And this is where God in his wisdom and his grace and his mercy sent Jesus Christ. He sent Jesus, the only person to have never sinned. The Bible calls him the second Adam. And Jesus who was righteous and who lived a totally righteous life, willingly took the payment for our sin, the punishment or the penalty for our sin on himself. The Bible says by his stripes we were healed, by his death that we've been forgiven. And so in Romans, it says that God was righteous in declaring us righteous. The righteous God who can't tolerate sin, can't live with sin without judging it because he is righteous, bore himself in Jesus Christ, bore the penalty for our sin. So God was righteous in declaring us righteous. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness so that he might be just and be the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus.
always gone. Did you like the Brumbies jumper? Did you notice the Brumbies jumper? I did, yes. <laughs> I think what it out. <laughs> I think one of the, the things that I had to come to terms with, with understanding the righteousness of God, is that you can't have righteousness without justice. The very fact that, that God is the measure of righteousness means that everything else must be compared against him. Mm. And it's, it's, if you, and we, so we have this kind of innate, it's, I guess, part of the nature of God within us to want justice. You know, like that song says, what about me? It isn't fair. And when we see crimes that uh, have gotten, that people have gotten away with, you know, there was a, a horrific film in the news um, just this last week of a, a guy running down the road who got shot and it looked like the, and, and killed uh, the people who were after him. And, uh, and it looked like, and that was three months ago and they hadn't been charged and everyone goes into uproar. So you can't have righteousness without justice. Did you have something to go? No, that's good. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's like, it, it's, we, we've got this, <laughs> you know, this scale for the bathroom and, and that is a righteous scale. It's just in its decisions. <laughs> and, and, uh, Uncomfortably so. <laughs> and like, like the one in my dream, which would put me at 178 kilos of muscle or 175 without my shoes <laughs> of muscle. That's you're dreaming because you get on that and it doesn't lie. And, and God is just and he's righteous and he has to, there has to be wages and consequences for sin. Yeah. You know. And if you thought of, I know there's objections in the community uh, about a God who judges, but then on the other hand, they're up in arms if someone gets away with, with murder or gets away with a horrible, a horrible mm. thing. You know? Yeah. Um, and it's one of the challenges that, that uh, atheists had especially is that is there an absolute truth? Is there, a, is there some things which are absolute righteousness, you know, in which, uh, it, it doesn't matter if no one else in the world thought it was right. If no one else in, in no one else uh, in in Europe thought it was wrong to kill six million Jews, would it still have been wrong? Mm. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, because it yeah, sometimes majority just because the majority believe yeah. it to be true doesn't mean it yeah. is. So, so moral righteousness is independent of whether we what we think mm. it's right or we think it's wrong. It's an absolute truth. And for there to be that moral righteousness, there has to be a, a being, a deity who, who has, who is that and who thought that and who knows that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, I just love that verse in, in Romans. It's, and the dilemma is, of course, can would, would you take injustice into heaven? Would God, would we want injustice in heaven? No, of course not. Would, would we want there to be so that has to be judged yeah that's right yeah you know? and it says in romans 8 it says that, that that god was judging sin in christ jesus he was judging sin yeah he condemned it says he condemned sin in the flesh praise god yeah you it's, know it's good game. And, and the thought uh, it says in romans 3 that linda read there that he was righteous or just in the bible it's the yeah. same word he was what was it there verse 26 um he says his righteousness at the present time so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Yeah. So he's just and the justifier. Or another translation says he was right to declare us righteous. righteous. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because we couldn't be declared righteous if it wasn't that someone else took the payment for our sin. Yeah. yeah. That's right. There's a lady in Texas at the moment, you know, with all this closed down and she's, and she owns a, a salon with, um, I think she's got 19 employees, hairdressers and that, that they work there. And she's had to, she, she, they're all phoning up saying, we, we haven't got any money, we can't do this. So she decided to open it and she got arrested and charged and put in jail for opening the salon. And the governor of, Te of Texas came out and said, this is wrong. If something's not done about it, I will pay the fine. Wow. Right, mm -hmm. and uh, and he offered to go in her stead, so that she wouldn't have to go to jail. And so that way, 
the governor reconciled the law mm. with justice, with mercy. Yeah. Hmm. That's cool. And it's a beautiful position that we can have if you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Yeah. That you are God is right to declare you righteous. Yeah. He is just to say just to say you are righteous. Yeah. He's fulfilled the demands of justice. And I love that. Because mm -hmm. you know, when yeah. Satan comes to you condemning, what can yeah. you say? Um, the righteousness of God in Christ. I have the righteousness yes. of God. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I, I, no, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, no, you are sure. Well, I just, I was, because I think, well, we have been called justified. We've been called righteous. So what does that mean for us then, like living as the justified ones, as the righteous ones, because of what Jesus has done? And I remember my dad always tell a story, and forgive me if I say it wrong, Father. He's watching. He's watching, so hopefully I say it right. You say it justly. Um, <laughs> but I remember he would tell a story of how um, he used to smoke cigarettes. Love you, but he used to smoke cigarettes, and um, he would say that every time he would smoke, he would say that I am the righteousness of God in Christ. And every time he pulled out a cigarette, he would say the same thing: "I am the righteousness of God in Christ." And he'd be smoking and saying the word, smoking and saying the word. But then one time, then he picked up a cigarette, lit it, and he said, "I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. I don't need this anymore," and threw it out. And he hasn't smoked since. That's beautiful. And it's like that is what the position that's what that's who we are yeah and it's the realization of that guys yeah and i'm listen often it, it goes against us we cringe mm -hmm. but that cringe in itself is a form of self-righteousness because that that is saying well you know some for some reason perhaps i should or could deserve what is this free gift yeah what has been given to us and that in that in a sense is a self of a sense of self-righteousness um it's understandable and we can swing that round to be thankful mm -hmm. you know but in that story of the uh of the american aircraft carrier heading towards the lighthouse you know we're the lighthouse yeah we're the ones who have been made righteousness it says we have been made the righteousness of god in christ jesus yeah so when accusations come our way we can say well you know, it's just me and Linda and we've got the dinner and the kids are asleep, but we're not moving Yeah. because we're righteous. So yeah. we're, and we can defend, knowing our righteousness, we can defend any of the promises, mm -hmm. we can defend any of the blessings, we can stand on any of the truths of God's word, knowing that we have been declared righteous and yeah. it was just of God yeah. to declare us righteous. That's so good. Heavenly Father, you are right to declare us righteous. Yeah. Praise God. It's part of the armor of God. It is the of righteousness. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's part of our battle against Satan. Yes, right. You know, the you know, the Bible talks we we war not against flesh and blood, but powers and principalities. Well, it's not us wrestling them. Mm. It's 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 them trying to get us to change our belief and not know our righteousness and not know our yeah. authority. Yeah. So we take we we fact to find a righteous God, yeah. we must be declared righteousness and that's why we went around in that circle in that message because if you're to find a righteous god and one day we all will stand before a righteous god right. yeah and for us to stand and not burn for us to stand before him and not be judged because yeah. he's a just god yeah we have already had to be judged in christ jesus mm. praise god it's good we're going to say a prayer now before we close yeah. Would you lead a salvation prayer for us? Yeah. I call this the prayer that lasts forever because you pray it once, you're saved, you receive it. Yeah. And after that, you just say, I receive my righteousness. Yeah. I receive my forgiveness. So Chloe will lead us in that prayer to receive the righteousness of God. Yeah. So just repeat this after me. So Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father. Uh, I thank you. I thank you. For sending Jesus Christ. For sending Jesus Christ. To die for me. To die for me. I ask you. I ask you. To come into my life. To come into my life. And into my heart. And into my heart. I call you Lord of my life. I call you Lord of my life. I confess, I confess, Jesus is my Lord. Jesus is my Lord. He is a son of God. He is the son of God. And he has been raised from the dead. And he has been raised from the dead. In Jesus' name. In uh, Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise God. If you prayed that, so the first time you prayed that, you are now 
considered by God to be his righteousness, yeah. as righteous as Jesus was, forgiven, saved, and entered into the kingdom of God. Yeah. Praise God. Amen. Well, we have some, uh, we do have some prayer we requests. We do have some prayer requests, yes. yeah. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, so um, Karen, we believe with Karen right now with um, migraines. She said that um, to agree with her for prayer for that, that is not happening no. on her body. So let's take authority over that. And mm -hmm. as well as their um, financial things happening this week for that to go smoothly. Yep. So, and we've yeah. had some wonderful testimonies of financial provision yes. in the church and people actually prospering and doing better. <laughs> yeah. Yep, yeah. Oh, I lost my job, but they're doing better. And uh, Elise, uh, Elise had some good news. She was accepted into Rana Bible Training Center. That's right, uh, yeah. in Tulsa mm -hmm. and uh, she is prospering in this economic chaos yeah. you know that's going on the church prospers and she's prospering and she's going look my bank account yeah. getting work getting investing and the government's yeah, dishing up to pay for it called back to another job that they had to um, let her go yeah and they, they've asked her to stop work again so yeah. and, and you're doing really well because you, you know the thought of going back to work <laughs> yeah <laughs> and i'm like huh. I'm, I'm doing i like how it is right now god has been so he's so faithful yeah. but we can yeah. all receive that that blessing yeah. is for all of us and i know yes you know like this this uh god provides a way out for yeah. us yeah. in this situation for you and for me my uh, but personally i'm not getting the income that i would have been because it's just relief teaching falls through the gap but god is still providing for us abundantly yeah so we want to believe that for you Amen. certainly kieran and matt we're going to believe in a grief for wisdom for you so we will just pray that yeah. and and then we'll talk about what's happening this week before we close sounds good all right so let's pray together and come to agreement with them so father we lift up karen and matt to yes, you lord sir. with this financial thing that's happening this week but we just pray it over that situation that it goes smoothly and Lord, we thank you for great favor upon them, that yes. your favor surrounds them like a shield in Amen. Jesus' Amen. name. And Lord, we also take authority over those migraines that are trying to come on her right now. Lord, yep. we just speak healing over that, that she has been made the righteousness of God in Christ, and we stand on that righteousness. Yes. And Lord, we thank you for your healing power at work in her mind, that it releases in her yep. mind right now. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. We pray peace. We pray peace into Karen's mind. Yes. And, and peace, the absence of conflict. Mm -hmm. We thank you, Lord, for resol resolution of all those things. We thank you, Father, that migraines are not your will. Yep. So in the name of Jesus, we take authority over them and anyone else in the church family or anyone else that's listening to that. Yeah. And in the name of Jesus, too, we commission angels to go out and to bring in work, to bring yes, in provisions, you, you, to bring yes. in uh, uh, the, the contacts that are needed for everyone who hears this that we're all provided for. We're, we're not under the covenant of this world. Mm -hmm. We're not under the covenant of COVID. We're under yes, a living yes. covenant with a living God. Yes, we have been declared Lord. righteous yes. and we have a God who provides for mm -hmm. us. So, so just claim those things yes, now you, and leave them. Thank God for them, for your mm -hmm. family and, and for, you, for wisdom, for health, for joy, for provision in Jesus' name. And all the people said, Amen. 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 Praise God. We're what on we got? our way out. This week we're at Mother's Day lunch. Yes. Yes. Uh, Wednesday night we've got Bible study. We're doing, what are we doing? Healing. Healing. Healing on Wednesday night yeah. at 7 p.m. So the yeah. same way that we do it like this on Zoom, we have yeah. that as well for um, for Wednesday night Bible study at 7 o'clock. I mean, so we're going to cover the healing in the atonement, how healing was provided for the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, uh, which is really good to get as a foundation for faith. And then on Friday week we have... We have the Pictionary slash Charades Night. So yeah. not this Friday, but next Friday, which is the 22nd or something of May. So um, like I said in the email, if you can't draw, act. If you can't act, draw. And if you can't do both or can't do either, come along anyway. Get with a friend who can. It will be fun. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and we'll be going back to small groups. So I think by then we'll be able to have groups. It looks like from the government's forecast, we've got about 10 more weeks of these meetings before we can meet again. So we're looking forward to that. Guys, I would really ask you to hook up and connect with others in the church yeah. and others outside the church, all right? Um, I just sent a message there from Andres. He claims healing for his wrist and favor as he does his English yes, test. Amen. In the name amen. of Jesus, we claim healing. Yes, Thank, yes. You, Lord, Thank you, Lord, for he full Lord. healing in Andres' wrist and yeah. favor and accomplishment has the, the, like the wisdom or the knowledge like Daniel had. Yeah. to do his English tests. Praise mm -hmm. God. Thank yes. you, Lord. Amen. Great week. 
Good. We love you guys. Connect. Invite friends to church here and we'll upload the video in a couple of hours for you to watch.